be seated. Again, I just want to say welcome to all of you here uh, and welcome to any folks who will be watching this video of the service. Uh, please know that you're welcome here and you're, you're thought of. As far as announcements are concerned, uh, on June 5th at 9 a.m. we have a parent's breakfast and we ask that you sign up in the Narthex for that. And then on June 8th, we have the senior lunch. And please call the office to RSVP um, and bring a hot or a cold dish. Those are the only announcements that I really have. Are there any other announcements that anyone would like to bring up at this time? Yes, Jen. Um, Jen Mommert here. Just want to remind you that VBS is coming up in July. So if you are interested in volunteering in any capacity, um, leading groups around or volunteering to lead a station, please see Angie Markey or I for to sign up with us. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. That that Vacation Bible School, that's, that's just an awesome outreach that we have at the church. And I would really, really encourage any of, of you. Um, I don't know about you, but I get a lot of energy from the younger kids and from younger people in general. So if you want to come away from something energized, I really recommend that you sign up for Vacation Bible School. Okay, let's sing our hymn of praise, Great is the Lord, number 187, and we can say seated for this. You can tell I'm really a novice at this. Um, okay, for Kids Club? Yeah, I think the song is meant to be for Jackson, but I don't know if that ended up. Yeah. Did they have it in the slideshow or not? Oh, there we go. 
Okay, I guess we're going to be singing this a cappella. <laughs> Oh, you're asking me to lead this. Waiting for Oh, here we go. <laughs> All right, well, it's me again. You remember me from before, right? So I, I have a lot of questions for you. All right. Have you ever done something really bad? Yes. Yes? All right, well, honesty. Okay. So it was something that you, you probably knew it was wrong, but you did it anyway? Yeah. But then we make it good? Yeah. All right. Maybe there was a small voice inside your head telling you it was wrong. Or but maybe you, um, you just aimed a, just, um, a hit that doesn't hurt. A hit that doesn't hurt. OK. Well, you probably shouldn't be hitting somebody in the first place, right? <laughs> so, so when we think about doing things wrong, we think about the Ten Commandments, probably. You remember this? Those of you that went to Bible school? No. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So, so what are some of the Ten Commandments? Can you remember? No. No. What? Obey your parents. That's a good one. Why? What else? I don't know. Don't lie. Don't lie. Okay, yeah. no, don't lie. So, how about wanting more than you already have? All right. Maybe, maybe around Christmas time when you're writing your Christmas list. All right. Or Easter when you're just thinking about your Easter basket. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, how did you feel after you did something wrong? I you felt bad? Maybe, Jordan, maybe you felt guilty, maybe you felt sad, maybe you regretted it. So, so what did you do after you did something wrong? Your mom sent you to your room? Okay, yep, you got punished. Maybe you, um, maybe you apologized if you hurt somebody. All right. <laughs> Maybe you tried to do something nice All to right. make up for what you did. All right. All right. Well, did you know something else that you can do when you do something wrong? Uh, no. Other than say you're sorry or let your parents send you to your room? No. No? No. No. You can pray. We can pray. Yeah. Right? You can ask God for forgiveness. He will always help you through the consequences. You can pray anywhere, anytime. Now, do you know how God usually answers our prayers? Does he say, maybe he says yes or no or wait? We have, we have a pretty unruly group here today. <laughs> yes, I see that. You have to stop now. 
So even if God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want him to, he always answers them in a way that is best for us. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Good. We know that God works in mysterious ways or ways that we can't understand sometimes, right? Don't forget the microphone. But we always have to remember he has a plan and a reason for how he answers our prayers yeah, if we do something it. wrong. So, to tie this back to the Bible, and I think, uh, I think that's what Pastor Bob and probably Pastor Cody would want me to do, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Because I have a microphone? Okay. So the people of Israel did many wrong things. They went through, they went through so many cycles of listening to God, but then they would fall back and do bad things. They would worship other gods. Um, then they would repent. God would forgive them, but then they would slip back into their old ways. Um, and this continued for a very long time. But God told Solomon and the people of Israel, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal the land. You know what that means? You you know what any of that means? All right. So what that means is... Oh, my. What that means is God made a promise to Israel that if they repent and return to God, he will rescue them. Ah, yeah? All right. So let's pray. I'll bow our heads. Can we pray? Can we pray? Thank you, God, for the promise you have made to us. We take comfort in knowing that we belong to you forever because Jesus died to take the punishment for our sins and save us. We thank you for your forgiveness and taking away the guilty feeling when we hurt others. Help us control all of our wants and wishes each day and remind us to be joyful and glad in our hearts for the good things that you have done for us. Help us, God, to remember to pray about everything and remember that your answers are always best. Help us also to remember to spend time with you each day. Thank you for providing the Bible, this church, and prayer to help us know you. Help us to love you with all your heart, all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you, God, for loving us so much and keeping your promises. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you. That um, I just want to say a word about uh, the children's sermon and kids' club. Uh, This is something that was more recently started by our church, and it's, I just think this is a pretty wonderful thing. I, you know, having that number of kids to be up here with us, that's, that's a very big deal, I think. And I'm so grateful for the people over these last few months that have done the children's sermons and have uh, taken the kids for kids club and their Sunday school. I had the I had a time where one of my grandchildren, one of my granddaughters came and she came up and uh, she's a pretty active, almost three-year-old. And I just remember she was climbing all over here. And then when she went back to kids club, that just continued along. And, uh, but the teachers, Pam was there at that point. She just had the best time and she still talks to her parents about the time that she came to grandpa's church and she got to sit up front and then she went to Sunday school class. So these are seeds that get planted. I mean, obviously the kids up here, these are young, but whether you think they're listening or not, those seeds can certainly bloom at some point in time. Uh, They certainly did with my granddaughter, and I'm sure that the seeds 
are growing with these kids too. So again, for any of you that have helped with that, uh, I just want to say thanks. As you know, Pastor Bob is on vacation this week, so um, we have, I don't want to say a substitute pastor, but we have someone who has agreed to come and uh, share the word with us today. His name is Cody Schwanger. Is that right? Okay. Cody Schwanger. Um, when he comes up, I just, hopefully you'll give a little bit of background for yourself, but I just want to welcome him. Some of you have already welcomed him and introduced yourselves to him, so thank you for that. Um, let me go ahead there. The, for, for the scripture lesson, um, there are actually two lessons this week, so I'm going to read through the first one, which is 1 John chapter 1, uh, and it begins like this. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with, a, with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Uh, the second scripture lesson is Matthew 5, 14 to 16. This is actually written in your bulletin, so if you want to follow along. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Good morning. I'm really glad I got to know Bob a couple months ago. I met him over while he was at West Green Tree, the congregation that I'm coming to you from helping to celebrate the retirement of our senior pastor, Mick Allen. And uh, over that course of that meeting, we got to chat, and um, he had mentioned that you guys were going to be needing somebody to fill in while he was away, and so I'm just very thankful to be here. Thank you for all the warm welcome that I've had, and uh, thanks, Ken, for filling in as best you can for Bob. I appreciate it. You've been doing as, as well as I could have, so... Yeah, so I'm, I'm from West Green Tree. I'm one of the ministers there, and I'm just taking a little break from what you guys have normally been doing. I understand you guys have been working through the Bible, but I thought it'd be kind of nice just to do a, a little bit of a break. So I'm going to just take a look at two kinds of light that exist in this world, and we're going to be looking at us as the light reflectors, and we're also going to be looking at the source 
that is the source of the light. So I just want to start with that, um, just a story. I found that this story is applicable on many levels. It's a story that took place a couple years ago in hunting season. So I don't know how many of you guys are hunters or if you guys are campers, if you guys, anything outdoors, I'm in it, I, I'll go with you. It's something that my family is very passionate about. And even if you're not, I'm sure you've had moments where you've been in complete darkness. And so this story, it just kind of, you know, it warms, it's warm to me because of my love for hunting and of my, especially the times I get to spend with my younger brother doing that thing. And so I remember this was an archery season. You get up really early. You get up, um, in our case, we get up almost two hours before daylight because we have a mile hike to the top of the mountain where we have our tree stands. And so we like to be in there before light. So you're walking in in the dark, and my brother, being the younger brother, nine years, sometimes things go missing as he's getting ready for work, or for hunting, I mean, and, um, or he, things aren't charged fully, and this was the case. We're walking up the, in the mountain on a trail. It's dark. You can't see without a flashlight, and about halfway up, he tells me his flashlight is starting to go out. Uh, he didn't charge it or whatever um, was happening to his light, it wasn't working. And he was going to be the case, though I didn't realize it when he told me, that he was going to be walking to his tree stand in the dark. Um, he doesn't know the mountain quite as well as I do, so to walk in the dark without a flashlight is a pretty big deal. Um, and what eventually ended up happening is I had to give him mine so that I had to walk to my tree stand in the dark kind of thought I could do it better than he could. And that way he'd have a light to go to his tree stand and we're about 200 yards apart. So, uh, you know, classic older brother taking care of the younger brother, I hand him over my flashlight, which happens to be pretty good one. And it's hard to see, but it's very bright. If you look at it directly, it, it can blind you almost. You know, I, as I'm walking away, I'm stumbling in the dark. I'm tripping over logs, I'm slipping on rocks, and I'm about 50 yards away from my brother at this point when I hear him go, or I, I, rather I see the light flash on, and his words, 50 yards apart, you're supposed to be quiet in the woods, and I hear, oh yeah, this is nice. And you know, just this imagery of one who is walking in the dark, stumbling in the dark, and another who has light can see and is walking clearly without problems, able to navigate the wilderness, able to navigate dark times with ease. And so that brings us to this morning's text. I'm going to reread for you from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, and we're going to read understanding that this is the this is us, the reflections of light. So again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14. And this is coming off of the Beatitudes, and he's about to transition into the rest of his Sermon on the Mount. So it's a pretty important idea that he's telling us here. Again, verse 14. You are... The light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. You know, it's, it's good for us to remember in this moment that it isn't the good works that is what gives us light. It's not the good works that shows light. But it is important for us to see that we are meant to be light bearers, that we are supposed to be in a dark world, in a world that I think we can all see is continually darkening. That it, all the more important for us to be the light stand reflecting the light. But we aren't the light source. It is very easy to do good works and not have the light within you. There are many people who do not know Christ, who write checks to charities, who donate their time to 
mentor young people, whatever that might be, there are people who are more like, not like a flashlight, but more like the moon that might reflect some of the sunlight and it shines off. See, the light source doesn't come from within. The light source is maybe just a reflection of some of the things that are inherently within all of us, this ability to both do bad and to do good. Um, something that God puts inside of our, uh, our self as image bearers. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the light is from within us. And that brings us to 1 John, a letter that John is writing to people in Ephesus, maybe around 90 AD. He's writing to a people who are becoming sort of paganized. They're about ready to turn the next century. It's a generation who has probably never seen Christ, never heard him speak personally. It's a generation who has been Christian for some time now, but in a world that was definitely not Christian. And so they were getting to the point where they needed to be reminded of a few things. And so that brings us to our second scriptures. I'm going to go a little bit into chapter two as well. So if you turn to 1 John chapter one again, we will see the source of the light, the source that comes from within ourselves. 1 John, starting at chapter 1, and I'll read, start with reading verses 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So these first four verses, sort of an introduction to his letter, but it's also a mirror of his prologue in the Gospel of John. What he wants to put out right away is the reminder that Christ was there from the beginning. And he refers to Christ, instead of referring to him as the word, as he does in the gospel, he refers to him as light. And he tells us that this light was made manifest. And he wants to remind us that this eternal light offers us eternal life. So that, by believing this, we might have fellowship with the saints, with ourselves, but more importantly, so that we might have fellowship with Christ. And this fellowship with Christ, this communion with Christ, is the key to our reflecting light, to our bearing light to the world, a light stand, if you will, a flashlight to those who are walking in a dark world. If we're going to be light bearers, we need to be connected to the source. And so we read farther, verses 5, and we're going to go into chapter 2, verse 2. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so the first few steps we take for the light to shine from within us, for us to be connected to the source, comes in the form of repentance. Recognizing that we are stumbling in the dark without Christ. That we cannot deny the fact that we are sinners. We must accept this reality 
if we're even going to be remotely close to having Christ from within us. We're told by John's words that if we claim that we are in the light, but we walk in darkness, we are liars, and we make God to be a liar. This is certainly not what we want to do as people who are supposed to be the light stands of the world, people that are supposed to be shining light in a dark time. And so the first step for us is repentance. Let us not be stumbling around in darkness, but let us be connected to that source. And so what does this begin to look like then? Well, if we've confessed our sins, if we recognize that we are in need of the light, the next step would be to turn from those sins and turn to something else. And so we read as we continue in chapter 2, starting at verses 3, we read this. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. And so again, if we're turning away from our sins, if we've repented, recognizing that we were walking in darkness, and we are going to turn to walk in light, John displays before us what needs to happen. It becomes a life that transitions to following the commandments of God, not out of this sense of needing to do so because that's what brings upon our grace and our salvation, but because if we are to shine that light, we are connected to the light, we are now walking in the same way as Christ does. That is a complete repent attitude of repentance. The key to being connected to the source then is not just simply acknowledging that we're walking in darkness, but it's doing something about it. It's turning and walking as Christ did. But we go a little farther. We can simply stop here and say, well, we just need to follow the commandments, but I believe we can make this more specific. And I know that John does here as we continue reading. Uh, it's not just simply a message of do better. It's a message of specifics. And so we read, continuing chapter 2, verse 7, we come to what John calls as a new commandment. Though it's not new, it's refreshed. Verse 7, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eye. And so it goes more specific from just simply a broad do what God says to very specific commands. Um, you'll remember when Jesus is pressed and he is asked, well, what is the most important commandment? What his response? His response is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and the second is similar to love your neighbor as yourself. And then, of course, we know the, the parable that follows, this idea that we are to love our neighbor, asking, who is our neighbor? The guy says to Jesus, well, your neighbor is anybody whose need you see, whose need you can meet. And then so goes the parable of the Good Samaritan. If we are to say that we are walking in the light, if we are to say that we are followers of Christ, then love comes natural. You see, this idea of love is the summation of all of the commandments wrapped together. It's how Jesus could say two commandments, and you'll notice that the first, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, is vertical. And the second, a summation of all of the other commandments that go horizontal, to love your neighbor as yourself. This is what shining light looks like. If we are to do this, to abide in Christ and for him to abide in us, so that that light source is not generated from ourselves but comes from within, 
we will love our brothers. We will love in a way that no other people does. That's what makes us light in a dark world. And the world is getting much darker. But you'll notice that when I started, I shined this light in an already lit room so you couldn't see. But it's not a secret to know that if the world or as a sanctuary would, uh, you know, in an image of that world, if we were to dim the lights to where there was no more light, you would see that light shine much brighter. And I believe that is the case for us as well. If we keep the course, if we continue to shine the light of Christ, as the world gets darker, the light will shine brighter and God's glory will be known and made manifest. So the charge is simple to love your neighbors as you love yourselves, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, to shine light in this world. The charge is to let your light so shine to all the world. Amen. Thank you, Cody. Please stand for our final hymn, number 402, Christian, Let Your Burning Bright. This kind of reminded me of when I was an early Christian and I read these verses, you are the light of the world, a town built upon a hill cannot be hidden. And I thought at first as an early Christian that that was a boast, like, hey, we're the lights of the world. And I've come to learn that as Cody said to us, loving our neighbors shows that we're light. It's a servant it's really a servant light. It's not a boast, it's a servant light. And that for me was an, a very important realization. It was a big step in my Christian faith. So as we think about this, as we reflect on this, um, I would just encourage you to remember that this is a servant 
light that we do, and especially in our world today, when we can show love for our neighbors, for our brothers and sisters, what a bright light that really is. Let's pray. Dear Lord, again, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for the word that Cody has shared with us. Lord, I just pray that as we leave this place and we go out into the world, I ask that you would continue to show us how to be true lights and that we would follow your word and your guidance. I ask these things in your name. Amen.